Well, exam one results. A lot of folks did well, a lot of folks didn't. But for those of you who are still struggling, there's still ample time to earn plenty of points and make a strong grade. But it's up to you. You got to do it. All I'm reminding you is that the opportunity to do that is there. Because I know this stuff is tough. That's why as we proceed, my common practice is to make earnable points on quizzes and exams increase. Because as we go along, everything we consider at a particular time may well depend on all the stuff we've been through. Science is cumulative. It's like learning math. Cumulative. You wouldn't want to go in calculus class and not be able to do algebra, would you? Hey. The stuff we're going to do this term. You can't let go of the acid-base knowledge and equilibrium knowledge and stuff like that. Because a lot of what we're going to do is going to depend on that. Now then, also as a reminder, special quiz one is at long last due tomorrow. I should say you've had ample time to deal with that. Special quiz two I'm already working on. I expect that to be issued probably this week. Tomorrow, discussion class, even though I know you've all looked at the phase diagram for water in chemistry 2045, you cannot possibly have looked at it from a, an appropriate perspective because as I've reminded you, the phase diagram for water is a free energy diagram. How does the free energy for water at a particular set of conditions compare to the free energy of water at a different particular set of conditions? If the free energy for water liquid equals the free energy for water solid, what condition do you think exists? If the free energy for water liquid equals the free energy for water solid, what condition do you think exists? Between? Between liquid and solid. <laughs> you are at the so-called normal freezing point, or if you prefer to call it melting point, for water liquid. Water liquid and water solid can only be in equilibrium if their free energies are the same. If their thermodynamic stabilities are equal. It's the only way these materials can be in equilibrium. That's why I wonder how in the hell these textbooks can expect you to get at this stuff in chapter 14 or wherever they consider it, and they haven't talked about free energy. I don't get it. But we're not going to worry about those cripples. Now then, since we've introduced you to this very f important fundamental thermodynamic relationship, the relationship which lays foundation for de determining whether or not a reaction under the conditions that it's being observed can proceed. In other words, is the reaction spontaneous? And if it's spontaneous, the change in free energy for the reaction is a minus number. That may be because delta H is XO and determines the spontaneous nature of the reaction. Or it may be because delta S is positive. An increase in entropy is proceeding as the reaction proceeds. And that determines why the change in free energy is favorable, negative, spontaneous. It may be because both of these factors drive the reaction to being spontaneous. So I've summed up these considerations here. I wonder if any of you remember seeing these very same considerations in the discussion section for assignment seven of your 2045 L lab manual. Anybody remember that? Do you remember 
Last time we talked, you know, that's ancient history. Friday. I told you, if you want an excellent review of what we are presently considering in this introductory chapter on thermodynamics, go back and reread the discussion for assignment 7 in your 45L lab manual. I hesitate to ask how many of you did that. I hesitate to ask how many of you even remember that I told you to do that. But I will tell you that when we first got together at the start of this term and many times thereafter, I said, if you want to be successful, you do what I tell you. And then you've got a good chance. And if you don't do what I tell you, you don't have any chance to succeed. I'm sure you remember I said that. I hope by now you realize I mean it. I mean it for you. I want you to succeed. But this stuff is tough. Chemistry is tough. And I choose to expose you to real chemistry. And the hell with this Pablo Mickey Mouse junk that comes out of these general chemistry textbooks. Which hide real chemistry from you. I don't want to do that. you please for your benefit so what we were just talking about the change in enthalpy is favorable exo bond improvement is taking place and the change in entropy is favorable positive then delta G is guaranteed to be minus the reaction is guaranteed to be spontaneous that doesn't mean it will go but it does mean it can go under the conditions that it's being considered if del H is endo plus bond disimprovement, the del H factor is against this reaction being spontaneous. And delta S is not favorable, minus. That guarantees that delta G for the reaction is plus. The term I use for that is anti-spontaneous. Because if for this system you have a mixture of reactants and products, will a reaction occur in the system? You betcha. What is the reaction? What is the reaction that occurs in the system if it's a mixture of reactants and products? What reaction occurs? What reaction occurs? From products back to reactants. That's what's happening. Or call it right to left from a direction standpoint. If delta H is endo, bond disimprovement, but delta S is favorable, plus, then delta G can be minus. The reaction can be spontaneous. If what relationship exists between the absolute magnitudes of these two terms? Which one has to be the bigger term? Which of these has to be the bigger term if these conditions exist and you want the reaction to be spontaneous? Which got to be bigger? So, what can you do to make this term bigger? Yeah, you heat the system, by golly. On the other hand, if the change in enthalpy is favorable, bond improvement, exo, a heat liberating reaction, but the change in entropy is not favorable, then delta G will be minus, the reaction will be spontaneous, if the absolute magnitude of the change in enthalpy exceeds the absolute magnitude of T times delta S. What do you do to affect this? Because the only thing that you can control is what? That's what you can control. Cool the system. And the final possibility is, for the terms in this relationship, that del HR and T del SR are equal. Now recognize, if these terms are equal, one of these has got to be for the reaction, and the other one's got to be against the reaction. 
If these terms are equal, then if, if this is exo, this is unfavorable. But if this is plus, this is endo. So only way these terms can be equal. Then, what's the value for delta G? And what's the condition under which this reaction system exists? You got it. Now, to try to be sure you understand what's going on with these fundamental thermodynamic properties of a reaction system. Hydrocarbons, as you well know, are common fuels. The main upshot of which is that when you combust a fuel, like methane, with oxygen, and make these products, you're running a reaction which is highly exo. Do you think this reaction might also be driven by a favorable change in entropy? What do you think? Well, entropy depends on amounts of materials. One mole, two more moles. Three moles of gas making one mole gas, two moles liquid. How does entropy relate to phase? It's most, it's highest for the vapor phase and lowest for the solid phase. So it's a good bet that this reaction as written is spontaneous because of delta H or T delta S. Well, you know it's exo, so you know it's driven by delta H. You think it's also driven by T delta S? You think delta S is favorable for this? <clears throat> Probably not, because water's in the liquid phase. Nevertheless, because of the highly exothermic nature of this reaction, well, pardon me, because of the highly exothermic nature of this reaction, as written, 890 kilojoules are liberated. The minus sign means XO. You've learned this before. And the superscript zero means you've calculated this value using standard enthalpies of formation, which we'll talk further about in just a moment. Now what if we choose, whoops! To reconsider this reaction, with water being in the vapor phase. You think it's likely when we run this reaction we'll get water in the vapor phase rather than water in the liquid phase? Now usually barbecue cooks or people that use gas ranges at home don't use methane, they usually use propane. But my bet is You've all observed the reaction which takes place when propane is combining spontaneously with oxygen. How many of you ever cook outdoors with a propane burner system? Or how about indoors? Gas range. Maybe your folks had a gas range. Do you think that reaction produces water in the liquid phase? Why not? Damn hot, isn't it? You'd have a heck of a time frying an egg at 40 degrees centigrade. But the question is, let's look at the same reaction with the one difference being water is made in the vapor phase instead of the liquid phase. Now it's entirely possible that this thing is driven by both delta H and delta S. To find out, you'll have to use the information that you see in the thermodynamic properties data table at the end of chapter 20 in the notes, which we'll talk about further in just a moment. My question at this point is, since this reaction, as you well know, is still quite exothermic, because this is what you're doing at home, except again, you're likely using propane rather than methane. But you know it's an energy liberating reaction, you know it's highly exo. Is this reaction, 
where you're making water vapor two moles instead of water liquid two moles. Is this reaction liberating 890 kilojoules as written? Or is it liberating more than 890 kilojoules as written? Or is it liberating less than 890 kilojoules as written? Three possibilities. Only one of which, of course, is correct. How do you vote? All right. Back to the election booth. The second reaction where we make water vapor instead of water liquid also liberates, as written, 890 kilojoules. Aha! Nobody's going to vote for that one. So the second reaction is written where we're making 890, I mean where we're 890, we're making two moles of water vapor instead of water liquid, liberates thermal energy greater than 890. Less than 890. We have only a smattering of correct votes. Because less than 890 has got to be correct. Do you see why? If I want water liquid to become water vapor, am I looking at a process which is exorendo? Water liquid to become water vapor. That exorendo. Endo. You got to put in the thermal energy to make that happen. So here where we got water in the vapor phase, some of the thermal energy is maintained in the system to keep this in the vapor phase. Means that for this, delta H absolute magnitude is less than 890. Pay attention to phase. You have to do that. Now then, language. Language which you should have heard about in 2045. Language which I know you heard about in 2045 laboratory assignment 7 if you paid attention to the information in the discussion section. Because the relationship delta GR equals delta HR minus T delta SR is conditions in specific. It applies to any imaginable set of conditions. However, if instead I talk about a reaction under these conditions now I've got a specified set of conditions which gives me an absolute basis for determining whether or not the reaction under consideration is spontaneous. So the question is, what are these conditions? Well, they're called standard state. What are standard state conditions? So, where we have written meaning, question mark, this designates the thermodynamic standard state, the superscript zero. Just means the data you're considering have been measured under standard state conditions. And in case you didn't realize this from 2045, when you make a measurement under standard state conditions, all reactants and all products must be in the system initially, in the standard state. And then you observe the reaction to see which way it goes. If it goes left to right as written, then the standard change in free energy is minus, the reaction is spontaneous under standard state conditions. If it goes right to left as written, then delta G0 is plus, and the reaction is anti-spontaneous. Because products convert to reactants. And if it happens to be the unusual case that delta G0 is zero, then you're looking at a reaction system which is at equilibrium in a standard state. That doesn't happen very often, but we'll look at a couple cases. Not right now. Now back to the language. How do we establish the standard state for the possible components of a reaction system? 
Well, what are the possible components of a reaction system? Liquids, which in chemistry means a pure liquid, not some ill-defined solution, which can have two or more components, or a melt of a mixture. Liquid means pure. Solid means pure. Gas, gas means pure. And what's the remaining possible component of a reaction system? Liquid, solid, gas, and what else? Liquid, solid, gas, what else? Aqueous. Now that's if our solvent is water. Solution species, solute. That's it. Those are the only possible, four possible, these four entities are the components of a reaction system. Solid, liquid, gas, or solute. Did you get that in 2045? Now then, if I'm looking at a reaction which contains a solid, maybe more than one solid, what do I do to put this solid in the standard state? You don't have to do anything. By definition, it's in the standard state. <laughs> All you got to do is, for the reaction under the conditions being studied, put in the right amount of solid. How about liquid? What do I do to put the liquid in the standard state? Ah, pardon me, one other thing. Put the solid in under one atmosphere pressure. Now, I'm using the old standard state pressure of one atmosphere rather than the new convention of one bar. I just read a ref research paper on this. Most data that we are looking at today, according to this paper, are still referred to one atmosphere as the standard state. And there's damn little difference between a liquid in the standard state pressure one atmosphere versus a liquid in the standard state pressure one bar. Same for solids, same for solute species, because one atmosphere is 1.01 bar, so they're almost equal pressures, not quite. An atmosphere 760 torr, a bar is about 752 torr, something like that. So we'll stick with atmospheres, all right? So. By definition, pure liquid or pure solid in the standard state under a pressure acting on it of one atmosphere. That's it. All right? Now, what about solute species? What condition do I establish for the solute species to be in the system on, in a standard state? In the standard state. Remember, solute species. As soon as I say solute species, does the term concentration come to mind? Tell me, what do you think is the concentration which establishes solute to be in a standard state? <coughs> one molar. Now, some studies are done under one molal. You can do it either way. We'll stick with one molar, since that's a much more common concentration term. The remaining possible component of a reaction system is a gas. If a gas is to be present in a reaction system under standard state conditions, what must be the partial pressure of the gas? What do you think? One atmosphere, One atmosphere by golly. Let's keep it simple as possible. So keep in mind, if you are studying a reaction system which has got two or more gases involved, each gas has got to be, if it's in the standard state condition, at a partial pressure of one atmosphere. So if I got two gases, what's the total pressure acting on the system? Correct. Two atmospheres. How about that? That's just Boyle, I mean Dalton's law. Remember Dalton's law of partial pressures? Dalton's law of partial pressure said, says? The total pressure on a gas system is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the gas components. No more, no less. That's one way to phrase Dalton's law. There's another way. We'll be talking about that shortly. 
All right, so we talked about what this means. Standard state. And now we've learned how to establish the standard state for the four possible components of a reaction system. Solid, liquid, solute, which is a liquid phase component of a system, and gas. Now, if I see this sub F attached to one of these thermodynamic, thermodynamic terms, like delta H zero, which means I got a delta H value measured under standard state conditions, what does the sub F mean? And if all you tell me is formation, I'll give you one point out of 10. Because it stands for formation. But formation of what and from what? Formation of what and from what? I think perhaps a simple way to get the meaning of the sub F across is to have you take a look at page 2011, which I've written there, and you'll see five reactions on this page. Roman 1 through Roman 5. Each of which involved the formation of the same compound, water. Of these five reactions, only one corresponds to the reaction which by definition is delta H sub F super zero for water liquid. Every one of these reactions forms water. There's lots of ways to form water. But only one of those reactions by definition corresponds to delta H sub F super zero. Notice that for these five reactions, even though they all form water, they have different delta H values, don't they? So they can't all be the same. No two are the same. Which of the five corresponds to delta H sub F super zero for water liquid? Now while you're thinking about this, let's go back to the sub F. Because the sub F means form blank moles. What am I going to put in here? How about that? One mole. Because you change the amount of material involved, you're changing the del H value, del S value, del G value for the system. So I got to specify how much material I'm talking about. In this case, I'm specifically referring to the formation of one mole, no more, no less, of a particular product. Do I have to specify phase? Did this remind us we have to specify phase? So here I've asked you to consider del H sub F super zero for water liquid. That immediately rules out one of these reactions, doesn't it? Doesn't one of these reactions show the formation of water but in the vapor phase? Maybe two, I don't remember, I'm not looking at the reactions. Okay? Form one mole desired substance in desired phase. All right, that talks about the products part of this formation. Now let's talk about the reactants part of this formation business. Formish, formation from what? Form from what? Because again, these five reactions that you're looking at on page 2011 show you you can make water a lot of different ways. Ways I haven't even listed there. You can decompose hydrogen peroxide and make water. You can dehydrate hydrated metal ions make water. All kinds of ways to make water. So formation from what? You're supposed to have learned this in 2045. But I'm gathering you didn't. So let's learn it now. You form the stuff from the required mole quantities. I'm not going to write this down because it's all in the notes. From the required mole quantities of the constituent elements. Elements 
in their thermodynamic standard state. Uh, pardon me. From the required mole quantities of the most stable allotropes of the constituent elements. It's all in the notes. From the required mole quantities of the most stable allotropes of the constituent elements in standard state condition. Okay? What are the elemental components of water? Ooh, that's a tough one. Hydrogen and oxygen. How many allotropes are there for hydrogen? Two. How many allotropes are there for oxygen? Three. Do we all know what they are? The O atom itself? Ozone? And? <laughs> I gotcha. I caught that thing from our air atmosphere which is that version of allotropic oxygen that exists in this air atmosphere. I'm looking at it with my super microscopic eyeballs. You are now endowed with these super microscopic eyeballs. What do you see as I hold this particle? Do you see an O atom? Do you see an O2 molecule? Or do you see an O3 molecule? So that's the most stable allotropic version of elemental oxygen. And that applies to all elemental materials with one exception, that's phosphorus. I'm pretty sure the reason for using white phosphorus rather than red phosphorus as a thermodynamic reference phosphorus is that red phosphorus is damned unreactive. So if I want to make phosphorus compounds, I better use white phosphorus which is damned reactive. But usually we're using the most stable allotrope. In the case of phosphorus, we're not using the most stable allotrope. But we're not going to worry about phosphorus. So you can not be overly concerned with that consideration. So what are we forming? One mole of the desired substance in the desired phase. What are we forming it from? The required mole quantities of the most stable allotropes of the constituent elements in their thermodynamic standard state. Woo, that's a mouthful. All right, and before we do this, let's do this. Oh, which reaction? Three is the winner, all right? So just while we focused on that point, let's respond to this. I want you on your paper right now to write the reaction equation, which by definition, corresponds to delta H sub F super zero for this gas phase compound OCS. <laughs> OCS is produced by taking the CO2 molecule and substituting for one peripheral oxygen atom a sulfur atom. My officer's candidate school molecule, OCS. Write the equation for the reaction, for which if you measured delta H, you'd get delta H sub F super zero for this material OCS. Now my suggestion is, you start with this product. Because you know we're going to make one mole of this stuff. And the indicated or desired phase is gas, because that's the way this stuff exists under normal lab conditions. It's just that we're choosing to consider forming this stuff under normal lab conditions. We can do standard state studies under any set of conditions. There's no such a thing as a thermodynamic standard temperature. None. As long as the materials in question are stable, standard state studies can be done. Regardless of the temperature. Okay? We need oxygen, don't we? Which form? Yes. How much? We need sulfur, don't we? What standard state sulfur? Phase? How much? And now? We need carbon, one mole. So now let's jump to 20.3 and open up 
the thermodynamic properties data table. Go to the thermodynamic properties data table, which is table one at the end of chapter 20. Take a look at carbon. Now the two common allotropes of carbon, or allotropes of carbon with which we are most familiar, diamond and graphite. Look at the data table. Tell me which one of these is standard state carbon. Thermodynamic standard state carbon. Graphite is it. So we need one mole of carbon graph. So comes then the interesting question. Carbon diamond, carbon graphite. Which one appears to you to be more stable? Diamond. Diamond, a material of such structural integrity that I can make drill bits out of diamond and drill through damn near any other material because of diamond's intense hardness and structural integrity. Ha ha! But nevertheless, the carbon-carbon covalent bonds in graphite are stronger than the carbon-carbon covalent bonds in diamond. So why is it? For those of you who may be writing notes with pencil, graphite pencil, why is it you can tear apart this graphite lattice by shoving it across a piece of paper? Whereas if you tried to write your notes with a diamond tip pencil, your notes would be a series of scratches, torn paper. How can it be that graphite is thermodynamically more stable than diamond from a delta H standpoint. How can it be that the carbon-carbon bonds in graphite are stronger than the carbon-carbon bonds in diamond, yet the diamond lattice is much stronger and more durable than the graphite lattice? How can this be? Picture. There's a framework, framework Lewis structure for a single carbon atom in the diamond lattice. Showing that each individual carbon atom is covalently bound to four nearest neighbor carbon atoms. There's a model of the carbon lattice, carbon diamond lattice, pardon me. I know it's not very big, but perhaps if you can focus your attention on this white carbon atom, you can see it's covalently connected to four nearest neighbor carbon atoms. White, black, white, black alternate to make the model easily, more easy to see, to understand as you look at it. Now let's look at the graphite lattice. Here's a carbon atom in the graphite lattice. It's got three nearest neighbor carbon atoms, not four. And if you were to look really carefully at these models, I know that's not easy to do because of the size of the models, you'll see that this stick, which represents a carbon-carbon bond in the diamond lattice, is longer than a stick which represents a carbon-carbon bond in the graphite lattice. And that's because each carbon atom in the diamond lattice is sp3 hybridized. It's a carbon atom in a four covalent bond network, but each bond is a single bond. As opposed to a carbon atom in the graphite lattice, where each carbon atom is sp2 hybridized, composed of it contains four covalent bonds, but two single bonds and a double bond as opposed to four single bonds. And you know 
for bonds between like atoms. Double bonds are stronger than single bonds, aren't they? How could this be then? If the carbon-carbon bonds in graphite are stronger than the carbon-carbon bonds in diamond and the graphite lattice readily falls apart when you shove it across the piece of paper. Think about that and we'll pick it up from this point next time.